I don't know about you, but we've all gone through the same thing in the last year and a half. I don't want to belabor that point. There's been a, a, a real shaking. And even at this point, there's perhaps a, at best, maybe you're just, just wondering, hey, God, what's going to happen? How are things going to work out? Along with that, there might be just a, a concern or a nervous, nervousness. There might even be an anxiety. There might even be fear that you may be facing. And maybe it has nothing to do with what's been going on. Maybe it's something that's personal in your life. But this morning, I want you to know that God... God is real. God knows your situation. And God wants to help you in the most impossible things you may be facing. Doesn't matter what it is. I want to read quickly to you from a few uh, verses from Hebrews. And, and then I'm going to go, we're going to go to 1 Samuel 17. If you have your Bibles with you, uh, you can already go to 1 Samuel 17. Uh, and as, as you're going there, I'm going to read from Hebrews 12, verses 1 and 2. You know these passages. It says, therefore, we also, it's us as believers, since we are surrounded by so great a cloud of witnesses, let us lay aside every weight and the sin which so easily ensnares us, and let us run with endurance the race that is set before us. Let us run. Run. Run with endurance the race that is set before us. Looking on to Jesus, the author and finisher of our faith, who for the joy that was set before him endured the cross, despising the shame, and has sat down at the right hand of the throne of God. He is in authority. All power and authority has been given to him. He is sovereign. He is able to take care of your situation. There is nothing... There is absolutely nothing that you may be facing or going through that he cannot handle. He is able to handle every single situation. Praise God. Hebrews 13, verse 20 and 21. It says, Now may the God of peace, who brought up our Lord Jesus from the dead, I think that one of the, the greatest things that we face when it comes to that which would seem impossible is death. And here, it says the God of peace has, who brought up our Lord Jesus from the dead. He raised from the dead. He overcame death. That great shepherd of the sheep, through the blood of the everlasting covenant, listen now, make you complete in every good work to do his will working in you what is well-pleasing in his sight through Jesus Christ, to whom be glory forever and ever. Amen. Hallelujah. There is a path, there are steps that God desires for you to walk. We call that his will. And God desires for you to fulfill his will. Oftentimes, we're doing our own thing. Lord, not my will, let your will be done in my life. Not my plans, not my purposes, let your will be done in my life. I want to take you to the Old Testament, to a situation that was facing not just an individual, but that was facing an entire nation. In 1 Samuel chapter 17, it talks about an army of people that had come against Israel. And at that time, this is Israel under their first king, King Saul. And here, the Philistines are coming, and they, are, they have invaded, and they are coming in battle. And they are coming to, to overcome let me read from verse 1. 
Now the Philistines gathered their armies together to battle and were gathered at Soko, which belongs to Judah. So they're right in their territory. They encamped between Soko and Azekah in Ephes Domim. I'm sure that if there were Hebrew scholars here, you'd say, ah, didn't quite get the, the right uh, pronunciation of those words or those places. It says, and Saul and the men of Israel were gathered together, and they encamped in the valley of Elah and drew up in battle array against the Philistines. The Philistines stood on a mountain on one side, and Israel stood on a mountain on the other side with a valley between them. So just picture that. Two mountains, and there's a valley in between. I'm sure, you, hey, that place still exists. You can go there. And they're drawn up for battle. And it says, And a champion went out from the camp of the Philistines, named Goliath, from Gath. And Goliath means splendor. This guy was something truly to behold. Whose height was six cubits and a span. You might say, I'm not sure what a cubit is. The shortest amount of length, they usually say that a cubit is the length of the forearm, roughly. So the, the, the shortest length they usually used as a cubit was 18 inches. I'm, some of you that are using metric, forgive me. So six, so 18 inches, that's 12, or one and a half feet long. So that's about this long, 18 inches. So six feet, then we still have another six halves of a foot. I'm not a very tall individual. If you're using feet and in inches, I am five foot nine. In fact, if I'm going to be more accurate, I'm just about this much under five foot nine. I'm just a, a wee little lad. This guy was six cubits. And so, just to do the math for you quickly, we are talking nine feet, and it says one span. A span is the distance between your thumb and your finger. So we're talking probably another 10 inches or so. And this is why 18 inches is probably not the right measurement. So, just quickly, the, the lower edge that that border there is roughly just over nine feet. The top is nine foot. So if I'm coming up to the back here, I might be off the screen. This guy was to the top. That's the, the minimum height that he would have been. If, the, if you go by the 25 inches that some believe that, he, that a cubit was, this guy would have been 13 feet tall. He was huge. You might say, how can a man be so big? And he was one of just a few individuals left that were basically, there was a conceiving, and I'll tell you, every single demon that has forsaken his place to touch a human in a sexual way has been placed in the abyss. They've been bound and there's not too many, or there's demons that don't even think of going in that place, but it used to be, and, and this was the result. In fact, you might say, well, why did Satan try to impact the, the human line? And why did, did an entire population, po the, the earth's population, why was it wiped out? Because Satan had tried. He knew that there was a Savior coming, and he was trying to taint the human bloodline, and so there, there were demons. They're, they're in the in Genesis called sons of God, that forsook their place. Fallen angels that had sexual relations with the women and humans and the offspring were these giants. Most of them, or they were destroyed. There was something that happened even after the flood. 
And there were some that forsook. And here is the product, product Goliath. Now you say, now listen, you might say, oh, this is just made up. I'll tell you, there are things we need to recognize that go beyond what we see. It says this champion, and a champion went out from the camp of the Philistines named Goliath from Gath, whose height was six cubits and a span. He had bronze, a bronze helmet on his head. He was armed with a coat of mail, and the weight of the coat was 5,000 shekels of bronze. And he had, a bronze ar- he had bronze ar- armor on his legs and a bronze javelin between his shoulders. Now the staff of his spear was like a weaver's beam, like we're talking heavy. And I, I, I know this. When it comes to throwing a spear, I used to throw a spear in, in high school. It's called javelin, a javelin. And I can remember training for that. And I, I remember when I was, went from grade 9 to grade 10 and, and 11, the, the weight of the javelin increased. So in grade 9, I, there was a smaller, lighter javelin. I think it was, I want to say, 600 grams or something. I don't know what it is. And then so... The, uh, the, the senior javelin was heavier, and I noticed just it was just a little bit heavier, it was a little bit longer, and I could tell the difference in the weight. This guy had a spear that was like a weaver's beam, and his iron spear had weighed 600 shekels, and a shield bearer went before him. They say if you take these, these weights, the weight of his armor was just shy of 300 pounds. This guy was carrying around 300 pounds. That was part of his armor. This guy was not only huge, but this guy was, they estimate, this guy probably would have weighed somewhere between four to 600 pounds with his height. And then another almost 300 pounds of armor that he's wearing. This guy is moving around like 900 pounds of mass moving around. And this is what he's saying. It says in verse 8, Then he stood and he cried out to the armies of Israel and said to them, Why have you come out to line up for battle? Am I not a Philistine? And you, the servants of Saul, choose a man for yourselves and let him come down to me. If he is able to fight with me and kill me, then we will be your servants. But if I prevail against him and kill him, then you shall be our servants and serve us. And the Philistine said, I defy the armies of Israel this day. Give me a man that we may fight together. And when Saul and all Israel heard these words of the Philistine, they were dismayed and greatly afraid. See, I, I, we don't face any giants today. We don't have any obstacles like that in our day, it would seem. But I would beg to differ. At this point, there are things that you are going through. You would say they are like a Goliath. They are impossible situations. You say, well, how am I going to face this? How am I going to get through it? There's no way I can deal with this. A Goliath is in front of you, and there's a defying of of you moving forward, there's going to be something, someone, or whatever, to shut you down. How can we move forward? And it says they were dismayed and greatly afraid. I'll tell you, when there's obstacles, when there's things in your life, there is an emotional response. All of us have felt anxiety. All of us have felt fear. There has been turmoil in our lives. What do we do? How do we deal with this? I'll tell you. you say, Pastor, are you, do you ever have fear? Do you ever have anxiety? You better believe I do. And I've come to realize when I look and examine my lowest points, When it comes to my lowest emotional estate, I'll tell you where I'm at. I am at the place where I am looking at the situation from human perspective. And when I hear anything, it is always from a human perspective. 
And then the fear begins to creep in. The, lo the closer I look at something that would be appear impossible, the more I hear about it, the worse my emotional state gets, my spiritual state will get, because I am focusing on my flesh. And I'm looking at it from a fleshly, human point of view. Listen, we're all guilty. I shouldn't say guilty. It's just a natural human response. You know what? It'd be interesting to note how large the army of Israel was. Like, we're not talking just a few hundred men. We're not talking a few thousand. We know a count. We have a count in numbers. Numbers indicates, and this is coming out of, this is like... Four, 400 years prior, the number of fighting men of the 12 tribes of Israel was 605,000 men. This is 400 years later. We are talking possibly a million fighting men on one side of the, of the valley, and who knows if there were a million men on the other side. We're not talking just a few guys out saying, hey, let's, let's have a brawl. We are talking some major, major conflict and agitation and response humanly that would say, you know what, I'm, I'm fearing. And then, then to be called out by the champion, say, hey, you know what, in another way, hey, there's a possibility we don't have to have any, any, have any blood shed. Let's just have two guys fighting. Now, in verse 12, we have a, a character, another character comes into the picture. We have King Saul here, we have the armies, we have Goliath, we have the Philistines. And now, there's someone that enters the picture. Verse 12, it says, now David was, a, was the son of that Ephrathite of Bethlehem, Judah, whose name was Jesse, and who had eight sons, so... Jesse was one of eight brothers. And the man was old, his father was old, advanced in years in the days of Saul. The three oldest sons of Jesse had gone to follow Saul into battle. The names of his three sons who went into the battle were Eliab, the firstborn next to him, Abinadab, and the third, Shema. David was the youngest, and the three oldest followed Saul, but David occasionally went and returned from Saul to feed his father's sheep at Bethlehem. David was a teenager, possibly 16 years of age, 16, 17 years of age. He was the youngest of the eight brothers. And the Philistine drew near and presented himself 40 days, morning and evening. Every single morning, the challenge would go out. Every single night, the challenge would go out. I want, I want you to know, in your life, it seems like oftentimes it's not just something that comes and goes. There's a challenge against you, or there's something that comes against you, and it is continual in the morning, in the evening. In the morning, the next day, in the morning, in the evening. And it is just one day after another after another. And there is a, a taunting, there is a jeering, there is a, a, a thing right in your face impossible it would seem impossible to overcome and it's creating fear it's paralyzing you and so you are stuck you don't know what to do you can't move it's just like what do i do and i don't know about you there have been times where i have been paralyzed by fear thank god it hasn't happened often where there's nothing you can it's just i can't do anything i'm You might be in that situation, whatever your situation may be. What is the Goliath that you're facing today? Today I'm talking about overcoming the impossible. Overcoming the impossible. I like to, to add with it, David ran. David ran. Overcoming the impossible. 
And you're saying, oh yeah, that's how I feel. I just feel like I'm running. I'm running away. I, I want to get away. Whatever your situation, whatever your Goliath, maybe it's health, maybe it's finances, maybe it's relationships, maybe it's bondages that you may have, maybe temptations, whatever you may be struggling with. And there's this thing that would seem impossible in your, in your life. God talks about wisdom that we can have regarding different situations and dealing with this. And he says that the wisdom of this world, the wisdom that does not come from God, this is James 3 verse 15, the wisdom that does not come from God or descend from above is earthly, sensual, and demonic. Earthly, sensual, and demonic. For where envy and seeking, self-seeking exists, where confusion and every evil thing are, or that's where they are. There's, there's this wickedness when it comes to the wisdom that does not come from above. And I'll tell you right now, so often we deal, I don't, this world, their only recourse is self. We, tr we, we deal with things as to how we can deal with them, what we think is the best, what we have come up with. And so there's this thing that is of earthliness, of worldliness, of, it's of this world. Along with being of this world, uh, there are things that go along with this world, the lust of the flesh, the lust of the eyes, the pride of life. It's all about catering to you in your flesh. And so the wisdom that does not come from above is earthly. It's of this earth. There's been many times where I've tried to solve a solution in my own wisdom. It's not from above. It's from self. Well, this is what I think I should do. This is how I should deal with this, this, this problem. Sometimes it's, you know, so we deal with, with our issues in an earthly way. It's not wisdom from above. It's from this earth. And it says that the wisdom that does not come from above is sensual. It is about what I want or what will solve the problem according to my flesh and what I want my way. The thing is, when you have a giant in front of you, your way, you try one thing, you try another, and it's, you, you realize there is nothing's happening here. I can't overcome. I am feeling overwhelmed. What am I supposed to do? We're dealing with things according to what we want. So there's this sensual thing. And it gets, when it comes to things that are sensual, there's, hey, there, that there would be a gratifying of the flesh. I just want life to be easy. Sensual also has to do with even the areas of the sexual things about us sexually. I'll tell you, I, there's foolish things that people do that have huge ramifications, not just impacting their life, but relationship, marriage relationship, relationship with children. It's just crazy. And here, also, the demonic element, the wisdom that is not from above is demonic. There are demonic influences, and we need to be discerning of the thoughts that come into our mind if they are of God and his word, or if they are of this world and earthly and of our own flesh, or if they are demonic in origin. A lot of times when we're going according to the flesh, the enemy will come and there's that, that whisper that says, go ahead. Yeah. And there's other thoughts that come. If you, you keep on that, that, in that place, there are these, these thoughts that, that come and you recognize, man, this is not good. Your flesh would say, hey, but I'm going to follow my those thoughts. I'm going to, and the thoughts lead to feelings and emotions and, the, and, and lead to actions. We make a decision then and we head down the wrong path. 
with major consequences. To deal with the, the Goliaths of our lives is to deal with them not from a worldly perspective, from a, a, a personal perspective and a, a human and fleshly perspective, nor a, de, a demonic perspective. It's interesting that the world, they're, they're concerned. So what do they go? They want to know, how is my future going to play out? So they go to, they'll go to psychics and various mediums, and they'll, they'll attempt to find something out. They go to palm readers, doing tarot cards and whatever. How is my future? What, what is it going to, what's going to happen? The Lord says, these things, already way back, these are things that we don't do, that followers of God should not be doing. Seeking wisdom from the demonic. In John 10, verse 10, it says, that the thief comes to steal, kill, and destroy. I have seen lives devastated as people have gone according to the lies and followed the lies of the enemy. So devastated, not just them, those that are around them. But it says in first or in James 3, verse 17, it says, But the wisdom that is from above is first pure, then peaceable, gentle, willing to yield, full of mercy and good fruits, without partiality, without hypocrisy. Now the fruit of righteousness is sown in peace by those who make peace. We're talking the fruit of what is from God will come up as we say, God, that there would be peace in our lives. The turmoil caused by Goliath, and as we trust in the Lord, the Lord is saying, I'm going to bring you through the situation. I'm going to trust in the Lord. Going back to our story, so Jesse asks David, hey, David, you need to bring some food to your brothers. So David goes to bring food to his brothers. In verse 19, it says, Now Saul and, and, and they and all the men of Israel were in the valley of Elah fighting with the Philistines. So they're on either side. David gets up very early. And as he gets there, he's, uh, he sees that they're in battle array. So they're facing off against each other. They haven't started fighting yet. They're facing off. They're in battle array. And David left his supplies in the hand of the supply keeper, ran to the army, and came and greeted his brothers as they're in, in this battle array. And he talked with them. Then as he talked with them, there was the champion, the Philistine of Gath, Goliath by name, coming up from the armies of the Philistines. And he spoke according to the same words, same thing he'd been saying all along. So David heard them. For the first time. And all the men of Israel, when they saw the man, fled from him and were dreadfully afraid. What are we going to do? So the men of Israel said, Have you seen this man who has come up? Surely he has come up to defy Israel. And it shall be that the man who kills him, the king will enrich with great riches, will give him his daughter and give his father's house exemption from taxes in Israel. So here we are. The king is saying, offering these things. Hey, if there's anybody, this is what's going to happen. If there's anybody in the army... To, to square off against this, this Goliath, this giant, Here's, here are your uh, rewards. And every man is saying, oh, I don't care what the reward is. This is an impossible situation. Now here's a teenager. Verse 26. Then David spoke to the men who stood by him saying, What shall be done? For the man who kills this Philistine and takes away the reproach from Israel. For who is this uncircumcised Philistine that should defy the armies of the living God? I'll tell you right now. We as children of God are part of a mighty, there is a mighty army. And it's not just made up of human beings, but we are talking of angelic host. And we are part of this army of God. And I'm not talking in the physical sense so much as I am in the spiritual sense. And here David is asking a question, who is going to defy the armies of the living God? Do we really know who our God is? Do you know who your God is in your situation? Do you know? Can God take care of your situation? Can God really 
do something. The God that we serve is eternal. He, there's no beginning, there is no end to the God that we serve. He is omnipotent. He is all-powerful. He is all-knowing. He knows your situation. The God that we serve is able to speak things into existence. It's, he spoke things into existence. And the word gets to Saul that there's somebody that is he's even talking in a manner that isn't of fear. And the word gets to Saul, and Saul and David comes to Saul. And in verse 33, Saul says to David, You know what? You are not able to get, go against the Philistine to fight with him, for you are a youth, and he a man of war from his youth. And so David says to Saul, Your servant used to keep his father's sheep, and when a lion or a bear came and took a lamb out of the flock, I went after it and struck it and delivered the lamb from its mouth. And when it rose against me, I caught it by its beard and struck and killed it. Your servant has killed both lion and bear, and this uncircumcised Philistine will be like one of them, seeing he has defied the armies of the living God. There is a realization, I am, I am depending on God. The God that I serve is way bigger than Goliath. The God that we serve is way bigger than your situation. Hallelujah. And he said, the Lord who delivered me from the paw of the lion and from the paw of the bear, he will deliver me from the hand of this Philistine. And Saul said to David, go and the Lord be with you. And Saul wanted to give him his armor and and David tried it on. It's like, okay, this doesn't fit me even. Saul was, he says that Saul was a head taller than all the, the men of Israel. He was a tall man. David, just a, a, a teenager, didn't even fit. He tried, he tried to walk, for he had not tested them. And he says, I cannot walk with these, for I have not tested them. So David took them off. And he goes, and he gets five stones for his, for his sling smooth stones from the brook and he put them in a shepherd's bag in a pouch which he had and, and his sling was in his hand and he drew near to the Philistine and so the Philistine came again drawing near to David and the man who bore the shield went before him and when the Philistine looked about and saw David so now he's coming out David is coming out from the men there possibly a million men and one is coming out and here's Goliath standing in front of the Philistines and the armies of the Philistines. And he sees David. And when the Philistine looked about and saw David, he disdained him, for he was only a youth, ruddy and good looking. So, reddish and good looking. So the Philistine said to David, Am I a dog that you come to me with sticks? And the Philistine cursed David by his gods. And the Philistine said to David, Come to me and I will give your flesh to the birds of the air and the beasts of the field. Can I just say this? When you come in the power and the might of God Almighty in your situation, there will be a response from the enemy. Now, it will be one of intimidation. It says in First. Peter 5, it talks about Satan. He comes like a roaring lion. And there's this thing of intimidation that we would move, not be afraid, but that we would move even in the face of the, the Goliaths that we have, whatever it may be, because we are coming not in our own strength. Listen to what it says. In verse 45, then David said to the Philistine, you come to me with a sword, with a spear, and with a javelin, but I come to you in the name of the Lord of the hosts, of name of the Lord of hosts, the God of the armies of Israel whom you have defied. I am not coming in my own authority. I am coming in the authority of the name of the Lord, Jesus Christ. You, when you fight the enemy, you are coming not in your own authority, in your own power, but you are coming in the authority and the power of the name of Jesus that is above every single name on the face of this planet. And is above every, every name of any spiritual being that would be 
around us or in the heavenlies. His name is above all names. This day the Lord will deliver you into my hand and I will strike you and take your head from you. And this day I will give the carcasses of the camp of the Philistines to the birds of the air and the wild beasts of the earth that all the earth may know that there is a God in Israel. Then all this assembly shall know that the Lord does not save with sword and spear for the battle is the Lord's and he will give you into our hands. David recognized this. He had been in situations he recognized there was no way that he could take on a lion or a bear. But he was not coming in his own strength. He was coming in the power of God Almighty. And he was coming against this, this Goliath. I want you to know, it is not by sword or spear that we will overcome in these last days. The Lord is looking for a glorious church and we will overcome by His name. Under his name, under his authority. His name is above all names. And the authority that you have. The enemy, yes, when you stand up against the enemy, there will be this attempt to intimidate so that you would turn and run away. That's what he would have you do. <clears throat> Listen. Verse 48. For those of you that are fearing and you would run from it and it just doesn't matter how fast you run, that situation is there because it's part of your existence in your life. It's in your face. Look at what David did. So it was when the Philistine arose and came and drew near to meet David that David hurried and ran toward the army to meet the Philistine. We are talking about this Young man, and he's not turning, he's not waiting. As the enemy is coming towards him, he is running towards the enemy because he is not going in his own strength and power. He is going in the mighty name of Jesus. The situation that you're going through, you overcome in the mighty name of Jesus. We need to recognize that in these last days. That we're not going by our own strength, our own might, but that we would go in the power of Almighty God. In Jesus' name. Hallelujah. His name. Jesus was highly exalted. It says in Philippians 2 verse 8. And being found in appearance as a man. Talking about Jesus. He came in the flesh. He humbled himself and became obedient to the point of death. Even the death of the cross. The Holy Spirit was the one that led Jesus right to the cross. It was not a mistake. It was planned before the beginning of all time that Jesus, even as God would create us with free will, that Jesus would go to the cross and die for us because he knew that with free will would be the choice to love God or not, to be holy or not. And he recognized that there would be many that would, would fall. In fact, we have all sinned and fallen short of the glory of God, all of us. And there is a need for us. The greatest thing that comes against us, the greatest Goliath that we have, is sin. And one sin separates us from God. And it is Jesus Christ that took our sins 2,000 years ago, and he paid for our sins on a cross. Thank you, Lord. And so he became obedient to the point of death and even the death of the cross. Therefore, God also has highly exalted him and given him the name which is above every name, that at the name of Jesus every knee should bow of those in heaven, of those on earth, and of those under the earth, and that at every tongue, and that every tongue should confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. Hallelujah. I want you to know that nothing... Nothing has changed from this time. This was like 1,000 B.C. Around 1,000 B.C. when this event is happening. Nothing has changed in 3,000 years when it comes to overcoming. Jesus, his name is above all names. And even though David and those that lived before Christ came on this planet, they were all looking forward to the Messiah. They didn't know the extent of what he would do. We, 
looking back 2,000 years, recognize or should recognize the significance of what Jesus did for us on the cross. This morning we have communion. And we're going to remember what Jesus did for us on the cross. You might say, is this significant? The only way that David could do what he did, it was because the Holy Spirit came upon David with, with the anointing as David was anointed. In the very the chapter preceding this, listen. Listen. The power of the Holy Spirit, the power of God resting upon us is only through sacrifice. And not our sacrifice, but His sacrifice. I just want to quickly read a few verses from 1 Samuel 16, verse 1. It says, Now the Lord said to Samuel, How long will you mourn for Saul, seeing I have rejected him from reigning over Israel? This is what the Lord is saying to Samuel the prophet. Fill your horn with oil and go, and I am sending you to Jesse the Bethlehemite, for I have provided for myself a king among his sons, from one of his eight sons. And Samuel said, how can I go? If Saul hears it, he will kill me. Even the sacrifice, the things of the Lord, were being shut down by Saul, who the people had chosen. It wasn't God's choice. Saul was not God's choice for king, to be that first king. But the Lord said, take a heifer with you and say, I have come to sacrifice to the Lord. So even Samuel was being hindered. But the Lord said, take a heifer with you. So it's a bull. I have come to sacrifice to the Lord. Then invite Jesse to sacrifice and I will show you what you shall do. You shall anoint for me the one I, have, I named to you. And so Samuel did what the Lord said and went to Bethlehem. And the elders of the town trembled at his coming and said, Do you come peaceably? They knew he was a man of God. The power that rested on Samuel. Do you come peaceably? And he said, I, Peaceably. I have come to sacrifice the Lord. Sanctify yourselves. Clean yourselves up. And come with me to the sacrifice. Then he, then he consecrated Jesse and his sons and invited them to the sacrifice. There was a sacrifice. The anointing of the Holy Spirit, the power of the Holy Spirit is hindered as we don't acknowledge the sacrifice in our lives. That's why we have communion regularly. The Lord gives communion. I'll tell you, there are millions and millions, hundreds of millions of people that take communion. They don't even know what they're doing. He says, do this in remembrance of me. Remember my sacrifice, my body that was broken, my blood that was shed for you so that there can be the power of the Holy Spirit upon you to overcome the enemy, to overcome the Goliaths. Nothing has changed. It is the same today. And the sacrifice was made. And then the sons started coming before him, one after the other. And he started from the oldest. And so it was when they, when they came that he looked at Eliab, the oldest, and said, Surely the Lord's anointed is before him, the one that should be king. But the Lord said to Samuel, Do not look at his appearance or at his physical stature, because I have refused him. For the Lord does not see as man sees. For the man looks at the outward appearance, but the Lord looks at the heart. Where is your heart? What do you believe in? With the mouth we confess, but with the heart is where we believe. Do you believe in Jesus Christ and what he did for you on the cross? Do you believe as we take communion together? Do you believe <clears throat> that he died for you? Do you believe that through that the Holy Spirit can work? And even as the sacrifice was given 3,000 years ago here, and even as these men started, these sons started come be, coming before Samuel, the Lord kept saying, the Lord has not chosen this one. Or it would, would tell Samuel, no, not this one, not this one, not this one. And so all seven came before him. And the final one was, was David. David wasn't even there. He was tending the sheep. And Samuel said to Jesse, send and bring him, for we will not sit down till he comes here. So he sent and brought him. Now he was ruddy, with bright eyes and good looking. And the Lord said, Arise, anoint him, for this is the one. Then Samuel took the horn of oil and anointing, and anointed him in the midst of his brothers. And the Spirit of the Lord came upon David from that day forward. Listen. 
Nothing has changed. Nothing has changed. The Holy Spirit, the power of the Holy Spirit comes through the sacrifice, and even as we are anointed, we believe the Lord, that anointing is for us as well, and the power of God by His Spirit. Paul, he writes, the message of the cross is foolishness to those who are perishing, but to us who are being saved, it is the power of God. The message of the cross, Jesus Christ and Him crucified. He says, says to the Corinthians, when I came to you, I didn't come in excellence of speech or wisdom declaring to you the testimony of God. I didn't come, great orator, for I determined not to know anything among you except Jesus Christ and Him crucified. Now listen, I was with you in weakness and fear and in much trembling. Even as I read that this morning, I recognized as well, if we come in our own strength and our own flesh, that is exactly where we are at. The, as, the human aspect of Paul was in weakness, in fear, and in much trembling. Man, do I need the power of God. And that's what he says. And my preaching and, and my speech and my preaching were not with persuasive words of human wisdom, but in a demonstration of the spirit and of power that your faith should not be in the wisdom of men, but in the power of God. That our faith would be in the power of God. As we focus in on his blood, his body that was broken, his blood shed for us. If I could ask the worship team to come. To overcome. He ran towards the Goliath. We don't have to run from our situations because God is with us. David said to the Philistine, you come to me with a sword, with a spear, and with a javelin. But I come to you in the name of the Lord of hosts, the God of armies of Israel, whom you defy. And this day, the Lord will deliver you into my hand, and I will strike you and take your head from you. And this day, I will give the carcasses of the camp of the Philistines to the birds of the air and the wild beasts of the earth, that all the earth may know that there is a God in Israel. And I want you to know, in these last days, God wants to show himself powerful for your sake, in your life, and for those that you may be uh, associated with, that you could say, this is the God that I serve, that they would all know there is a God in Israel. Then all this assembly shall know that the Lord does not save with sword and spear, for the battle is the Lord's, and, th and he will give you into our hands. So it was, when the Philistine arose and came and drew near to meet David, that David hurried and ran toward the army to meet the Philistine. Then David put his hand in his bag, and he took out a stone, and he slung it, put it in that sling, and he started slinging, and he struck the Philistine in his forehead, so that the stone sank into his forehead, and he fell on his face to the earth. So David prevailed over the Philistine with a sling and a stone and struck the Philistine and kill, killed him. But there was no sword in the hand of David. Therefore David ran and stood over the Philistine, took his sword, Goliath's sword, drew it out of his sheath and killed him and cut off his head with it. And when the Philistines saw that their champion was dead, they fled. I'll tell you, nothing has changed. We can run not away, but towards the enemy in the power of the Holy Spirit. Our faith is in you, Jesus. Can we stand together? Therefore, we also, since we are surrounded by so great a cloud of witnesses, let us lay aside every weight and the sin which so easily ensnares us, and let us run with endurance the race that is set before us, looking unto Jesus, the author and finisher of our faith, who for the joy that was set before him endured the cross, despising the shame, and has sat down at the right hand of the throne of God, run by faith in Jesus. In Jesus' name, run by faith. Run. We need to run with his spirit, by his spirit, in Jesus' name. That you would overcome in Jesus' name. So run in Jesus' name. In Jesus' name overcome by his in his name by his blood shed for us by the power of the holy spirit whatever your situation the lord wants to make us complete to finish the good work that he would have us do according to his will doing what is well pleasing in his sight hallelujah it was great having you here today if you want to listen to more messages you can click here or here also, check out our website, lighthouseniagara.com, for more information and podcasts and also to give. God bless you. Have a great day.